you were at the Field Museum, you were meeting Monica? Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you were one of the students. Um, this is Monica Garcia. Some people they keep asking me about jobs and about being volunteers at uh, oh. scientific institutions. This is a lady right here to talk to. She's yeah. you're in charge of high school uh, yeah. volunteers this summer. Yeah, for team volunteers. Team volunteers. So if you were to fill out any applications, you would interview with Monica. So yeah. maybe you could smooth her today. Yeah. After, Let uh, me know. All right. Uh, and uh, Mr. Steele, if you would uh, announce our our special guest here today. All right. Nice and loud, Mr. Steele. <laughs> Dr. Bob Conrad is election manager. Uh, I don't know how to say this. Survivor, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming up today, gentlemen. So whenever you want the lights. Lights, Rory? Thank you. Mr. Steele. Mr. Steele. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Steele reached us from New Zealand. Um, it's just sort of put in perspective where um, we're on from down there. And um, I always have to put on my little um, New Zealand tourist hat to encourage any of you that is now a small country down there. So most of you are probably familiar with um, the beautiful landscapes that New Zealand has, especially. Um, Lately, with the Hollywood movie industry, with uh, Lord of the Rings and so on. <clears throat> and also, just to give you an idea where I came from, I used to live just on top of the ground, this hill here, out near this uh, dramatic coastline on the west coast, and it was about an hour from our um, largest city. So, New Zealand is um, quite special. You're going to hear a lot about New Zealand in the next. New Zealand is quite a, a special place. It's quite unique. Um, so we have 80% of the plants 
are found um, nowhere else in the world, but only found in Brazil. And that's extraordinarily high by global standards. And same with these other organisms. So we've got um, a lot of flightless birds. We've got this kiwi that you're probably um, might associate with Brazil. We also have these um, massive insects. And this is an adult pan. And uh, this is a wetter. It's huge. And we have these, we've got these large insects and uh, a lot of flightless birds because of Brazil. Have you ever had any mammals, um, native mammals at all? The only mammals we had were a couple of bats and um, seals along the coast. Have you ever had, um, like you guys had, bison, yeah, rats, and cats, and all sorts of things? Have you ever had any of them? And in their place, because um, we never had mammals, we had these insects that were sort of were able to grow really large. And sort of um, took the role of small rodents and so on. So, um, what do you think some of the major sort of research programs might be happening in the major disciplines of the field? So this is the study of dinosaurs and fossils. And we're all going to see you're all familiar with Sue, the um, T-Rex the main foyer of the field museum. Yeah. Well first of all, how many of you have been to the field museum? Right. So a lot of you would have seen the um, Sue right in the foyer of um, the field So another uh, major department is the uh, zoology department. They know I, I own that tie right there. They've seen me wear that tie, but he's got on right there. There you go. There is a connection. There's a connection. <laughs> yeah, there's a connection. Um, <laughs> so Bob Martin actually studies sort of early primate evolution. And it's um, So of course, another major area of research in this mix is um, botany, or the study of plants. And so um, the majority of plants are the greatest progressive is with the ground plants is um, something like half a million different um, But there are also other very important plant groups out there. Can anyone um, help me with another example of another major plant group? Just um, one in the back corner. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Does anyone know what that is? Yep. Excellent. So that's one major thing. Um, there's also um, not actually plants, and we'll also explain about this, but the house in the bottom of the called funky and mushrooms. Yes. And your, um, your ferns. Yes. yes. And then there's algae, which are um, considered as Anyone want to take a guess? 
Oxygen. Pretty fundamental. Yeah. Oxygen. Yep. Yeah. Right. Another one? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So you know, elementary. Uh, next please. You know, just some they're just fundamental. So they provide um food for humans and animals, and they're uh, just critical in, in all food chains. And of course they're um, really important food for us. And they provide you know, uh, clothing and shelter and um, the desk that we're, we're leaning on. Um, and also medicines. It, it turns out that uh, something like, well the vast majority of our drugs and medicines and pharmaceuticals, that sort of thing, they're all made for life. So they're really important. And of course, as you mentioned, um, contributing to oxygen. So, just briefly introducing um, what I'm proposing. We're not trying to go. No, you go in the doctor. Um, so, just want to introduce the, the bottom of the part very briefly. So, we have over 3 million dried species. Well, if you could just um, back up one slide. Passed around this, um, this specimen, and um, if you can see in the back, I just want to um, for you to note the label in the uh, bottom right hand corner. This, even though this is a fern, but it, it could be a, a lichen or a liverwort or a moss or a flowering plant. And um, one of the um, um, functions of the herbarium is to Talk about briefly. <clears> that is depositing a very hard material. Actually, sorry, I'm going to bring this back to the point so it ties in. Sorry. Right, so just um, introducing the, the bottom department. So we've got over 3 million dried specimens. We have um, 40 staff and students who have got curators and curations managers and scientists. And um, we have, um, it doesn't only consist of scientists, but there are uh, illustrators, there are people who are um, database experts and computer experts. And then we have uh, field with programs in over 20 countries throughout the world. And we also have, um, importantly, we have botanists from out the world visiting the, um, the field as well. And we also have um, teaching and student programs. Now, I don't know, this is last year or this year, with Michael Dillon talked to you. This year. That was this year. Yeah. Um, so, and was it to this class or? Uh, the, some of the, some of the students. Class. Right. Okay. So, um, Mike Dillon spoke to some of you. And um, you know when you become really famous because this guy had a, he's got a journal. So when people publish their scientific results, they publish it in a journal, and um, such as this one here, which is called Daniel. So he's, he's really famous. So where are all these plants stored? It's, it's called a, um, a herbarium, or a collection of dried plants. And so I mentioned how we've got three million um, dried species. We have four uh, wings to this collection, and in all of these cabinets that you see down there are over three million dried specimens people from all around the world. So um, you can think of the herbarium as like a library. So the collections are used for uh, so, uh, plant biodiversity, so documenting what species are grown where in the world. And this could also just be in the Chicago region of that gap. To help us study plant evolution or species relationships. Yes. And also um, study conservation of rare and endangered uh, species. So for instance, we might have a, a, spe a, a specimen in the herbarium that was collected in, in the 1920s somewhere in the school ground. And we know this because we've got the 
physical specimen or get a date on the label and so on. Well, then you could come back to this school ground and see if that plant is still growing here. And then if it's not, we could ask all sorts of questions why. So it, it has all sorts of um, uh, conservation and land management applications these days. And also, there's some material from the upstate uh, ecology of the, the uh, interaction between the plants and the garden. Um, now I can get on to my specimen I've like looked at before. Um, but the herbarium is a real important depository of, uh, of critical specimens that have been used for all manner of studies. And one such study is um, drug screening. So I mentioned before how a huge number of our drugs aren't derived. We've got a, a drug specimen here, and it's actually referred. But this very specimen, this very physical specimen. <clears throat> Chemicals are extracted from it, and you'll read in the, the bottom right hand corner that um, this is a voucher specimen for anti cancer and anti AIDS screening. So, people, scientists removed um, part of this plant, removed, extracted the chemical compounds, and then tested to see if they had activity. So it means if they found some really important drug, they need to document uh, where it came from, the, the country or where you collected it from, when it was collected, and what it's actually identified as, then your drug discovery would be with it. So I just want to very briefly um, go through the different and also show how illustrate how little walls are related to these different land plants. So, um, so um, we have algae that Thorsten is going to talk about, and these are confined to waterways. that little woods are primitive and simple and fire plants are advanced and things. Well, there's a series of features that uh, make them either primitive or advanced. One, of course, is um, the production of flowers. Fire plants are also in the flowers and the design. And one critical thing is that little woods absolutely essentially um, water. It's absolutely critical for Whereas flowering plants don't. And then the transport system, or we call it um, the vascular system, uh, which transports its own. Think of it as your veins um, and plants. And flowering plants, it's really complex. And just like our, our plants, it transports food and water. But it little water, it's very simple. Very, very simple. And then finally, uh, little water produces seed, but it's horse, but, and plant plants produce seeds. Don't already know the difference between them. So, what 
very simply our lookings on a really small planet with all the um, sort of tight and compact magnets or cushions. In fact, uh, they're very similar to mosses, which um, Brendan actually, without you can pass them around if you want. Okay, I'll just pass around the track. So they're actually um, very similar to this group of plants here, mosses. In fact, you wouldn't know the difference unless you looked at it out of the microscope. So they form these, these maximum cushions, just like in this tray. They commonly grow in moist and um, damp places. Now, considering I said um, what was required for reproduction, that's um, obvious that they're really common in these moist and you know, damp places because they need moisture and water for um, reproduction. They're also they're common in um, urban areas. So we'll find them in our backyard and on roads or walls and pavements. And then of course in natural areas they grow in forests and streams and mountains. And they grow on all sorts of substrates or surfaces. So they grow on rocks and soil, even on the leaves of, um, of trees. Just to illustrate um, that um, they're also early colonizers. Oh, can you just go back? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. They're early colonizers. So this is actually um, someone from the Jokers card from I think it's the first in the year 2000 or something into a bank. And um, little wards, this is a, a little ward actually occupied that really important process. And then uh, together with mosses that you see in the tray there, mosses and little warts, um, not only of these sorts of pictures from the tropics, but they're just clothing the trunks of these um, these trees. So does anyone know um, why they're called little warts? Why do you think they're called liver warts? Because they have work. <laughs> close. It's like liver. Yeah, 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 you're getting closer, getting warm. So, um, explain this one. Yeah, so in, in old English, um, wart meant, means plant, and then literally the, the word can be so in living medieval times, people thought little warts, and you've got to use your imagination, but people thought um, they looked like the, the outline of the, the lobe of the, of the liver, and they thought the curing of the liver. It turns out that they don't have that outline. That's why they have this whole thing. So I, I opened up how um, these groups of organisms exist in way from the brain source. So they were the first main plants, and they occupied the earth um, some 400 million years ago. So this was way before dinosaurs. And so meanwhile, dinosaurs um, evolved and became extinct. But this, these groups of guys, the wards and lichens, are still around today. So, um, so the water in the environment. They form um, obviously habitats or places to live for other organisms. Of course they, they contribute to, the, to all sorts of food changes. And then um, they have this awesome capability of absorbing massive amounts of water, massive amounts of water, uh, unlike any other plant. And this in turn helps protect you know, erosion and landslides. This, this is simply a, a, a slide showing some of the you know, wonderful um, diversity of colour and forms. So even though they're really small, when you look at them under the compound microscope, you see uh, these big forms. And then um, I'll just pass around this specimen. Although some of them, or most of them actually, they're not really exciting to look at with the naked eye. 
And so what I'm passing around is, um, I mean, in this box, you're only going to see a couple of pieces of um, bark. But on that bark are some little plants. And those plants, the little ones, have taken a photograph under the um, microscope. So you can actually see how complicated that is. So as you can see, I mean, this is, this is really nothing exciting. In fact, if you were to look at this with your naked eye, you could only see it but basically look like a bunch of eyelashes. So when you look at it under the microscope, it looks like this insect or plant. Right? So it looks really cool. And then, um, likewise, what I'm passing around the room here is um, this um, little tiny little wall. This is a this scale is a millimeter. So you can see how small the plant is. But um, even though it's really tiny, it's got all these interesting forms to it. And so in this case it's called the sacks. And there are actually little organisms that live inside it. In this case. And then this is just shown in the same fashion degrees of and again, um, you just look under higher power still and you see all these, these, these surfaces. You can see all these tremendous changes. Um, <clears throat> one structure that is unique to little ones and not found in any other plant group or animal group. And those are called uh, oil bottles. We've got inside the cell these little um, ball mounts, these little structures for oil bottles. And they're very really interesting because they have activity against certain types of cancer cells, um, bacteria, and fungi, and so on. So even though these, these plants are really tiny, they have some really interesting properties. Um, now, I just want to very quickly run through. Um, so, mentioned that the two areas that I um, specialize in looking at plants is in New Zealand and Fiji. And it turns out, you know, so why am I interested in these two particular areas, apart from one being high, which is always nice to go home once in a while. Um, but it turns out that Conservation International, this is a uh, big um, international organization, has designated 35 say, I'm going to describe as um, biodiversity hotspots. And so two key criteria to be um, designated as a biodiversity hotspot is having um, a high degree of endemism. Have you heard that word before? So um, endemism is organisms that are found, um, say, in the United States and nowhere else in the world. And also, the um, second criterion is the degree of threat, habitat destruction, and so on. And so um, that's why I study these plants in the And um, the most exciting part for me is the field work, and so you get to go on helicopter trips. Yes. Yes. Just run through these um, folk planes. And you see some dramatic scenery, and um, this is actually 2,000 meters in the air <coughs> elevation. And it was actually a, it was actually an old seabed. And just in case you didn't believe me that we were 2,000 meters in the air and it wasn't even the seabed, this is a picture of a little shell. So this area has been up to a few you visit islands, you can just keep all the floor. You see lush forests and genetic landscapes and stuff. But in all the regions we go to are probably wet because um, that's where this group of plants really enjoy it. I just want to finish up with Discover Life, which I'm not going to go into the details, but I encourage you to check it out. It's a cool online feature to help you identify perhaps what's in your backyard um, and all sorts of neat education. Anywhere, no? In the forest or somewhere, no? <laughs>
Okay, then I brought some light themselves to show. Actually, this here on the back, you see these, uh, these colorful, well, it's gray and <laughs> greenish stuff. And this is, these are lichens on bark that I collected actually in Michigan years ago. Or some lichens also occur on rocks like this one. And then some lichens like this here from Brittany were used for dyes to dye clothes. Or this lichen here grows on the seashore and Mediterranean climate and also in Western California. Or this lichen here was used to poison wolves in, in Scandinavia. So it's this one is actually poisonous. <laughs> so lichens are kind of similar to mosses. So they look kind of similar. Maybe they have they are not like as greenish as mosses, but they kind of look similar to mosses or other birds, the groups of organisms that is working for guys. However, they are completely different organisms. So they have nothing in common, except that they live in similar habitats and similar areas, different similar situations like on soil, some like this grow on soil, actually together with mosses here. And this is the reason why sometimes we can also go together on a field trip, collect together. However, we collect completely different organisms. The lichens I'm working on are actually two different organisms. So two different, completely different organisms live together in some kind of association and form uh, what is called a lichen. So, Two partners are in this association. One partner um, of this association are algae. And you probably all have seen algae. Has every, any one seen algae somewhere? Yeah, where, where did you see that? Yeah. In the pool? Okay. That's probably where you don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else has seen algae somewhere else? Yeah. In the river, yeah. Anyone has maybe seen them at the seashore, the uh, seaweeds are very common, like this here. <coughs> These are all seaweeds, all algae. So we know algae from pools, rivers, uh, the coast, and also when we go to a Japanese restaurant and eat miso soup, then Some small organisms, some unicellular small organisms, and this is a picture taken through a microscope. So they are very small. So now the eye will see those algae. And these small unicellular algae are actually those um, that form these associations with the other or type of organisms to form these ligands. And the, the algae itself. I mean, we vaguely know what algae are. They are kind of small, greenish stuff somehow. But uh, where are they in the evolution of the organisms? And this is a, a simplified evolutionary tree of the, of the plants. And here we have the plants planted in the left main use. And in planting these plants, we can include everything like trees, herbs, so all flowering plants, ferns, and also mosses and liverworts are here. And the sister group or um, yeah, the basal group to these land plants are different other groups. So we have here a number of different other groups. They all look different. And these algae are actually, we could consider them something like living fossils. So they are 
basal to the lens parts. So one part of the RNG are actually kind of related to the to muscles and liver birds, to the organisms and to the spoon. The second partner in this, this uh, lichen association are the fungi. And probably every one of you has seen fungi uh, like mold on bread or uh, some fungi in the woods or uh, mushrooms in food. So you are probably familiar with, with fungi. And one example. And uh, actually, these fungi, uh, Matt was mentioning this already, these fungi are closer to animals, so they are closer related to us than they are to plants. So <clears throat> when we have the evolution of the organisms, there's one, one uh, branch leading to both the animals and the, and the fungi. And this is just to show the diversity of so all these algae and land plants, mosses and so on, they are green. And what's the reason why they are why are uh, chlorophyll? Exactly. And why do these plants use chlorophyll for what? Anyone has an idea what what is the use of chlorophyll for plants? What do they do with it? Huh? Any idea? Just a guess? Eat? You said right here. What? Kind of, but, yeah. To eat? I mean, the plant eat the chlorophyll? Yeah, I mean more, what, what is the advantage for the plant? <laughs> well, for the plant itself, so how, how do plants survive? What do they eat? How is their nutrition? Exactly. They eat the sun, you could say. So they use the energy from the sun to produce carbohydrates or, or sugars, let's say. So, and the way they do it is they, they, they collect the sun and they use the chlorophyll to transform the energy of the sun into food energy. So chlorophyll is the key for nutrition for plants. Do fungi have chlorophyll? Really? No. Fungi, fungi don't have chlorophyll. Fungi don't have chlorophyll, so they need some other strategies to survive. And fungi actually developed several strategies. We can say basically three main strategies. One strategy is to live on dead material. So like <coughs> We probably have seen in, in four leaves on the ground, and they have some dark spots, brownish or whatever spots. And these dark spots are usually fungi that decompose this dead material. All little bit roses, some fungi are, are specialized to live on dung, like horse dung or so. Maybe some of you likes to ride horses or so, so then you may have have seen those fungi on dung So this is one strategy, and next slide please. Another strategy is to live on other living things and to parasitize those. So parasitism would be another strategy for fungi to get their nutrition. They can, they can be parasites on other plants, like the scarborough fungus or grasses, or they can parasitize um, insects like this fungus here. And uh, the third strategy is, instead of killing or decomposing something, we can also live with other living things. And this kind of association would be called a symbiosis. One very common symbiosis we have here, all the, basically, all the trees we have here in Illinois are dependent on an association with mushrooms. So these, <clears throat> when we look at the roots of these trees, we see some kind of uh, net surrounding these roots. And this net is bill is consisting of mushroom um, tissue, that's it. 
So here, the mushroom and the higher plant trees have a kind of symbiosis to, to live together that helps the fungi and the trees. And those, next slide, please. Those fungi that have an association with algae form lichen symbiosis. So we have this is, so the lichen symbiosis is just one of the strategies of nutrition, of survival of those fungi. And here we have a cross section through such a lichen, just one of those lichens I, uh, I showed you. And we, when we uh, have a look at such a cross section in the microscope, we see a layer where the algae are concentrated, and this is uh, called an algal layer. And when we have a closer look at these algal cells, we see that there is a very close contact between the fungal hyphae or the fungal cells and the algal cells. So there is, uh, there is some exchange of nutrients. The lichen itself does not look like algae or like fungi, so we can actually isolate the different partners, we can isolate the other partner that we have, the unicellular algae here, or we can isolate the fungal partner, and it actually looks on a, in a petri dish, looks a little bit like a ball. And again, um, we have a lot of diversity, around 20,000 uh, species are described worldwide of lichens, here's a tropical lichens and here this lichen is common in the southeast of the of the US. Or uh, any one of you has been to the Rocky Mountains or some high altitudes in the mountains, you you will know that the rocks somehow have some colors like yellowish colors and usually all the rocks are covered by lichens and uh, this like this is actually a very common lichen. So lichens occur on rocks or on bark. However, next slide. They can also grow on on old sides, and if it's if it's wet enough, uh, they even can grow on old uh, cars. So what is the why do we study lichens? And actually, I'm not the only one working in the field facilities who is getting paid to, to work with lichens. So um, there should be something um, of an advantage here. And I just want to mention two examples. One is lichens are very good in survival. They live everywhere. So we can go to, which is an advantage, you can travel everywhere to collect those. So, I have been to Antarctica or tropical rainforests, high uh, altitudes in the, uh, in the Andean mountains, everywhere you can collect these lichens. However, they don't do very well uh, with air pollution. So basically you can say the <coughs> more polluted the air is, the less lichens we have. Why do we care? Well, here we have two maps. Red means very few lichens are present, and green or yellowish, more lichens are present. So the air is, is improving, and in the city center, the air is actually quite bad, and there are only few lichens. Here is the same area, the same city, but um, not, the, not the diversity of the lichens is mapped, but the lung cancer mortality of humans. And you can s easily see that there is some, some correlation between so using lichens as an indicator for the air quality can help you to improve the air quality over, um, over, the, uh, over a larger area much easier than just, um, just uh, measuring single components of the air quality. And another example is um, the deforestation and primary and secondary forests. So a lot of um, Rainforests in the tropics are, de are, um, are cut and used for agriculture or then secondary growth um, occurs there. And sometimes, um, or not only in tropical areas, but also in, in 
boreal or temperate, temperate regions, after a while, it's kind of difficult to, to decide whether this is a virgin primary forest or a secondary growth when the cut has happened, uh, let's say, 112 years ago. And lichens are actually very good indicators. There are some lichens that need old growth forests, that need forests that survive there, that, that have been there for three, four hundred years to occur. And then using these indicators, you can assess the quality of, uh, of a forest. So um, how do we um, get the material in the herbarium that was mentioned in the collection? We actually have to go to the field, as I showed you when we, when we culture the, the lichens, they look completely different, we can't use the morphology there. So we have to go in the field, like here in Spain, where I go in with some colleagues there, and um, the lichens um, on the rocks we actually have to get off with the hammer and the chisel. And then they, these lichens are put into the collection and used for, for studies. And we can, as I already mentioned, find lichens everywhere, like in tropical rainforests or, or regions. And uh, this is an advantage just at, at the end of the finished So I have been in Antarctica on this January. Um, uh, we went to Kenya, to, I gave a course there, and then we came on the like and also some elephants as well. So one advantage of being a uh, botanist is uh, that you can show the elephants as well. Okay, so any questions about our Thanks.